Hello, my name is Alice Great, and welcome to the very first episode of the Inside the Petri Dish podcast, the podcast that dissects science and puts a microscope on the controversial topics within research. Um, I'm joined by my amazing co-hosts. We've got the radio presenter and voice actor, Vicky Blythe. Thank you. What an introduction. You sound so passionate about that. <laughs> I am passionate about that. Great. It's so cool. Hello. And then we've got Steminist filmmaker. Oh, that's a great introduction. Women in STEM champion. Oh, thank you very much. Taisy. Thank you. Thank Round of applause for everyone. Woo! Go us. Thank you so much for joining me on my grassroots podcast. That's great. Thanks um, for inviting us. I mean, thank you for turning up and drinking tea and having biscuits. I hope it makes it worth it anyway. Not just any biscuit. We've got Welsh cakes as well. We've got Welsh cakes. We so can't good. record a podcast in Cardiff and not have. Welsh cake. No, you'll just gently hear my hen glad when had I just gently <laughs> playing in the background. <laughs> so the aim of this podcast is just to open up a, the world of science towards people and really address the issues that people are concerned about. So before we get to the nitty gritty of what you guys want me to investigate, why are you passionate about science? Why do you enjoy science? Oh, am I going to go first? Yeah, go for it. Um, or just a tiny bit of background, I guess, seeing as it's our first one. Um, I studied biochemistry and medical molecular biology at Cardiff University back in 2001 and um, spent four years at uni, spent a year in the labs working on uh, isolating a gene to help develop um, treatments for osteoporosis. Um, and science has always been a really important part of my life and even though now I work in music, radio and sport and, and do voiceovers and TV stuff. Um, I'm a regular reader of New Scientist and, and I still, you know, geek out all of the time. But I don't professionally um, chat about science as much. I think I do with my friends, with my family. Um, and just generally when topics come up in conversation with colleagues and, or if you're in the pub even. And... And I think sometimes you forget how engaged we all are with science, but sometimes we don't realise that we're actually engaged with science because it's far bigger, it's political, it's economical, it's all of these things that we talk about. Um, so for me, it's really exciting to kind of get back to those roots and, and ask some layman's questions about what's happening in science right now. But also, you have the most relaxing voice. So <laughs> if you've been born with that voice, you've got to go into radio, I'm sorry. Thanks. You, you can be as science as you like, but when you talk, I'm just like drifting off. That's <laughs> why people fell asleep in all my presentations no. at uni. Uh, <laughs> but they're always the worst. Yeah. Oh. And Tay, what do you do with science? I... I think for me, I, I grew up reading a lot of fantasy fiction. I've always loved reading from a really young age. And I think a lot of the books that I was given as a young child involved things like exploration and inventing and finding out new things. And I used to follow lots of little characters that used to go on all these great escapades and get into all sorts of trouble. And that's kind of what science is for me. It's foraging into the unknown and going places where no one else has been before. It's, it's kind of like a big exploration. I it's find it really adventure. fun. Yeah, it's a big adventure. And you're big into your adventure anyway, so that's not a really surprising <laughs> thing to hear from you, like misadventure, <laughs> paddle boards along Bristol, like seafront. So. Oh, it's not as, uh, it's not as um, impressive as a lot of people that I know that, you know, I've, I've met people that have climbed Mount Everest twice and been to the North Pole and I just find it really inspirational. Women too. So. Yeah. yeah, well I mean you are a women in STEM champion. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, now that we're launching our podcast, the aim is that you guys set me a topic to explore and then I go away like a little minion and investigate it for Are you going to put a suit on? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. I've got a hat. You've got the costume. I've got a monocle. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> so, what do you want me to talk about for the first episode? 
We want you to find out about immunisation and vaccinations. That's quite a controversial topic to start on, Tay. It is indeed. (laughs) Why do you think it is so controversial? Like, I know loads of people who haven't been vaccinated and the thought of not protecting my children from, like, diseases and illnesses terrifies me. Mm. And especially, you know, I've got elderly grandparents or... Or I know people who cannot be vaccinated because they're allergic to eggs. I, why is it so, such a controversial thing? Do you think? Is it about parenting? I think we're, you know. I think anything that questions um, someone's parenting now has become such a massive hot topic. I think you know. I was born in 1981, and so um, I think media coverage and the way that we found out information through the 80s. Um, and the beginning of the 90s is very different to living in 2017 Mm. um, where we google every little thing you know I think from the moment someone uh, realizes that they're pregnant they start googling every (laughs) symptom everything that they should be doing and trying to give that child the best possible chance but I think within that we're ever aware (laughs) that life's more complicated these days and we have a lot more things on offer Um, our environment has changed Um, the chemicals we use the products we use are always developing and with that sometimes become stronger or um, and I think it's sometimes people's way of trying to maybe make a stand against um, getting too carried away and and not trusting pharmaceutical companies or not necessarily Mm. trusting doctors as we once did because now we ask questions is that right for my child is does that mean my child's going to suffer this or that or side effects and and i think yeah we're definitely more confident to ask questions and more aware of our surroundings now yeah i think um one of the major revolutions within scientific research has got a part to play in this i think because peer review has been hugely as a result or closely intertwined with immunizations and vaccinations because of the the scientific research that proved in you know floating quotations <laughs> um yeah air quotes not what's a floating quotation <laughs> um, that should be another podcast yeah we'll set that question yeah. later on in the film <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um yeah in air quotes proved that the mmr vaccine caused autism when mm. actually because peer review wasn't uh as as it's not, it is not now, as widely held as it is now no he got away with using fraudulent data and mm. so the media latched onto those results and damage was done so you've asked a lot of me for the first episode so i'm going to go away now and i've got some people in mind so i'm going to go and chat to them and i'll report back to you amazing So to help kick off the Inside the Petri Dish podcast, I am incredibly pleased to be joined by immunologist, PhD researcher and stand-up comedian Katie Walwyn-Brown from Manchester, who's going to tell us about her work. So thank you so much for joining me, Katie. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about what you do and about your research? So my research is looking at how the white blood cells of your immune system communicate with each other. Um, So you've got this amazing system of white blood cells that are constantly helping you to fight off diseases and infectious challenges, um, but they need to be able to work together as a team and coordinate your immune responses. So our lab looks at a particular kind of white blood cell called a natural killer cell. Um, People get really excited about these. I like to think of them as the assassins of your immune system. They're really good at killing viruses infected and cancer cells Um, but I'm actually looking at how they talk to another kind of white blood cell called a dendritic cell so dendritic cells are the first responders of your immune system they pick up signs of pathogens that aren't supposed to be there and show them to the rest of your immune system Um, but we now know that natural killer cells can in certain conditions actually kill the dendritic cells so I'm kind of looking at this friendly fire and trying to see why it's happening in certain situations and what it might mean for your immune response Um, we do a lot of that using microscopes as well so so we rather than trying to study cells in a human because humans are big and messy and complicated we take the cells out and get them into a petri dish um so we'll we'll um, take blood donations and take the white blood cells from them 
grow them up in incubators. Um, and then we will look at those cells under microscopes and using other machines to see how they're behaving in, in a more simple environment. So you said that you um, use donated blood. So is that something we do through the blood service? Is that where you get your, your research material from? Yes, actually. So um, it's an interesting one for us. So we get the leftover blood from platelet donations. So the blood cones we get are from the National Donor Centre. So when someone goes to donate platelets, their blood is run through this machine that pulls out all the platelets and we get the blood that's left over to do research with because that wouldn't be particularly useful for, for a medical blood donation because it's had all the platelets taken out of it and they're an important thing that helps your blood clot. So you wouldn't want to give somebody blood that doesn't have platelets in it. That's really interesting. So not only when you're donating blood, could it go to help someone, you know, someone in a hospital or at the roadside during an emergency, you're helping scientific research. When you were talking about um, your research, what interested me was the, the fact about detecting pathogens and how um, our body can do everything from detecting viruses to parasites to distinguish that from healthy tissue to help detect uh, infection. And, and destroy that infection. So that must not happen in people with compromised immune systems, is that correct? I mean, one of the interesting things about a compromised immune system is that, as we've said, that your, your immune system can go through all of these different stages of detection through to fighting an infection. And a compromised immune system could happen at so many different places along the way. So I think the biggest example of this is when you look at genetic diseases, so primary immunodeficiencies, people who are missing or have changes in a certain gene that means their immune system doesn't work as well. Those changes could affect just one tiny part of like how one white blood cell works. So you might get a genetic change which would affect those detection mechanisms, so maybe your dendritic cells or cells that we would call antigen presenting cells because they pick up antigens and they show them to the rest of your immune system. But you also might get a genetic disease which affects your white blood cells that work maybe later down that reaction chain, but that will also affect your, your immune system. So one of the examples is a protein called um, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome protein. So it's a genetic disease that's X-linked, so only boys get it. Um, but essentially, it's a problem with a protein that's really important for T cells and B cells, which don't kick in until quite late in your immune response, sort of 12 days later, they respond to specific threats. It stops them from being able to form immune synapses very well. So it stops them from being able to properly talk to other immune cells. And that can lead to these patients being immunocompromised. That's really interesting because... Sorry, that's a very complicated answer. <laughs> it's, it's not at all, especially when you're talking about something so complex. Because as you say, the immune system, it's almost like an orchestra that all needs to work together. So you've got all these different factors working, you know, downstream effects as well as different parts of the body who are all trying to address um, potential routes of infection. So it's, it's interesting when you're talking about genetic disease or things that may cause immunodeficiency, for example, chemotherapy, um, because it, it links into the fact that our bodies are so complex in how we have to defend ourselves to the outside world that even one of these little um, pieces in the puzzle, if, if that's wrong, that can lead you susceptible to some really dangerous conditions. Yeah, I mean, the orchestra metaphor is a lovely one because if one part's out of tune, it doesn't work. But also if the volume's too high or too low, you have a problem as well. So I guess you could think of low volume as compromised immunity. You can't really hear what's going on. But in a lot of people, the, the instruments are playing too loudly. You have autoimmune diseases, which can also lead into then compromised immunity because when people have, say, asthma or rheumatoid arthritis or a disease where your immune system is actually starts attacking your own healthy tissues, one of the main ways to treat that is by giving people drugs that turn down their immune response, but that can then leave them vulnerable to infection. So that's another thing that can leave people immunocompromised. Mm. And well, as you, as you mentioned there, um, rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, HIV is another case where it, these viruses can lead to you being really susceptible to infections. And so this sort of brings me on to what we're discussing in the podcast is the importance or the question behind immunisations and vaccinations. 
I mean, they're really important, especially if you end up in a situation where your immune system is compromised to help you fight off everyday diseases. So I guess the seasonal flu vaccine is a really nice, clear example because so many of us get offered it. So um, if you're generally very healthy, you might choose not to get it. Um, but people who are elderly also don't have immune systems that work quite as well and they really need it. Um, people who have HIV, as you said, um, and one of the I think one of the big things about so the vaccines that we all get as children, things like um, measles, mumps and rubella, is when you get a vaccine, you're not just protecting yourself, you're also contributing to herd immunity. So there will be some people who are so immunocompromised that they can't have the vaccine for one reason or another. Um, so it could be if someone's undergoing chemotherapy that their immune system has basically been completely destroyed in order to fight their cancer and they need to be protected from infections, but they can't get a vaccine. So they rely on everybody else around them being immune. I think when you mentioned MMR, what came to my mind is the importance of scientific engagement, because um, obviously there's been a lot of controversy around the MMR vaccine and um, its links with autism and actually when we look at the research behind that it was high, highly fraudulent and things and this can impact people on their day-to-day -day lives so people who aren't getting the MMR vaccine because they don't necessarily think that it's you know beneficial or they have personal um, uh, you know they they don't believe in vaccinating their children I think they don't realize that okay your child might survive or, or not encounter any problems due to lack of vaccinations because they're a typically healthy human being. But the people they interact on their day-to-day -day lives might not be at such a good uh, standing with their immune systems. Um, so for example, there was a story last year of um, a, a couple who'd taken their child on a, on a, a vacation after um, she'd finished her chemotherapy. She's about five years old and they took her on vacation um, and she had um, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia and prior to having cancer she'd had all of her immunizations and then um, she wasn't able to be immunized while she was receiving her treatment um, because obviously as you said um, your immune system is almost fully destroyed when you have chemotherapy to try and uh, tackle the overactive cellular mechanisms that are going on. And um, while they're on holiday, they, they their child interacted with another child that hadn't had the MMR vaccines. And so um, she'd been exposed to measles and she was really poorly. And so even if your child doesn't have these vaccinations and, and does perfectly well that doesn't mean that the people that they interact with in their day-to-day -day lives will do will be fine that's also comes back to what you're saying about herd immunity because it's even small things not necessarily a condition that can lead to needing vaccinations but people with things like egg allergies they yes. can't have vaccines either because we, we we propagate and produce vaccines using eggs don't we so if they had um the vaccines they could get very ill so they have to rely on other people having a good immune system yeah it's it's a big thing to think about especially and having spoken to parents who don't vaccinate their children because i do a lot of science outreach you'll go to museums eventually you do end up having a conversation with someone who doesn't believe in vaccinating their children and i think it's really important to remember that most people who are making that decision are just really scared about the potential health consequences and they are doing what they genuinely think is best for their children so i think as scientists it pays to keep an open mind we need to really just keep being there and being an open, friendly face that is willing to discuss and ask, answer people's questions respectfully without calling them stupid or insulting them. Yeah, and I mean, there was a, there was a case last year, um, another case really, of um, a Cana Canadian parents who were actually on trial um, because their their child had died as a result of meningitis and they hadn't vaccinated and and they'd been treating him at home with things like apple cider vinegar and horseradish and and sadly he passed away and one of the things in the trial that really came across was of course they loved their their little boy they they were trying to do the best for him but um i couldn't help but think i wonder if their minds would have been changed if there was more information out there um that was really um easily understandable and digestible
Yeah, it is really hard to know. I think there are quite a lot of people doing actual science communication research on the kind of things that make a difference here. It's something I don't know a lot about. It might be interesting to look into for future podcasts for you. Um, but there, there is actual research because as a scientist, I love anything evidence-based. So there are people really trying to find out what works and what doesn't as far as changing people's minds or getting information to them in a way that they can actually access it. Yeah, certainly. And I think one thing that, that I, I think sometimes doesn't get necessarily pushed in a, in a positive way is how the vaccines actually work through immunological memory. So by by giving your child exposing your child to this this virus or or um to the vaccine in the first place you're allowing the body to experience it so next time it experiences it in in an unsafe environment they have an enhanced response to subsequent encounters and that allows them to have um better protection against things like um flu for example for asthmatics or or people with diabetes and many other conditions but also things like cancer so we look at the hpv vaccine that's sort of currently being um rolled out amongst schools and we've recently heard that this is going to cut the number of cervical smears that need to be done so i think that needs to be really put across to people i think a lot of the concern comes from the, the carrier materials for the immuni- uh, immunizations. I know a lot of people worry about metals and things going into their children. And so I think transparency is really important. When- Definitely. I've seen some good resources explaining the different things that go into a vaccine. And I think a lot of people get concerned that it's this really unnatural thing to do. But as you said, it is ultimately just harnessing your body's natural responses so what you're injecting is a small piece or an inactive version of a virus or a bacteria or as you said even um, a virus that might cause cancer um, into the body along with a few chemicals that will give your immune system a, a good kick to get it going but then most of the protection that you're getting is coming from your own white blood cells doing things like as I talked about the antigen presenting cells, they'll be picking up that thing that's been injected, showing it to the rest of your immune system. Your body starts making antibodies and those antibodies are ultimately the thing that protects you and they're coming from your own cells. So, Yeah, so it's really harnessing your your own cellular response um, and, and what would be done naturally. So for example, for healthy individuals, if we get exposed to the flu virus, we might have it once, but next time we encounter it, we've got that immunological memory that helps us protect us again um but it's where people don't have that uh strong immune system to protect themselves so basically what you're doing is you're introducing us to the virus before we come across it in our day-to-day lives in a safe environment and doing it in a safe environment that allows us to protect ourselves and utilize that response that's internal within us next time we see the virus Mm. So it's there's a couple of different things you can introduce. So you can introduce a piece of the virus that's not even, you know, a whole virus anymore. You can take just one of the molecular patterns you might find there, like a protein or a, or a small part of it. Or you do get live attenuated vaccines, which is a version of the virus that's been made less able to cause a really nasty infection. Um, And those are vaccines that people are quite careful about giving to immunocompromised people. So yellow fever is an example of that. So it's it is a killed version of a well, a turned down version of the virus. But if you give the yellow fever vaccine to someone who is severely immunocompromised, there's a very small chance that the virus could start to cause disease again. That's really interesting. And one thing I also wanted to talk to you about was um, the the punitive measures that are coming into place. Because I often think of um, immunisations and vaccines as a form of community work, really. Because there's so many people who, who rely on herd immunity, because you're taking responsibility for making sure that your body is able to fight these diseases and that, that it minimises the chance that this gets passed on to people who can't protect themselves. I, I do see it as a form of community work. Um, and obviously there's a lot of talk at the moment about punitive measures for parents who don't vaccinate. Um, so for example, in Australia, they're banning children who haven't had 
full vaccinations from going into childcare um, with other children because of the knock-on effects it can have for the children within those groups that can't be vaccinated for certain diseases but also those the parents and the family members of the children what they could be exposed to through uh, having a child within their family who is in childcare with other children who aren't vaccinated. So it's, it's one of the topics we wanted to discuss in the podcast is the idea that um, parents could be liable um, for their children um, if, they, if they are injured or uh, unfortunately pass away as a result of not vaccinating uh, and um, contracting these conditions. In the case of childcare, um, in response to Australia setting this up, saying that if your child's not fully vaccinated, your child can't come to childcare, a lot of people have, uh, a lot of parents have said that they want to set up non vaccinated um, childcare um, groups as well, where children of parents who don't believe in vaccinations can go. And that's obviously a really bad idea. Uh, I guess. I should definitely emphasise that I am by no means an expert on the ethics or legality of the situation. Um, I don't think any of us are, to be <laughs> no. honest. My own personal response would be I can understand the the idea behind doing that and I can understand that perhaps if I was a parent with my immunocompromised child relying on herd immunity at a daycare, um, I would maybe feel differently if this was my own personal situation but instinctively I think when you start punishing parents for not vaccinating their children rather than trying to establish a conversation and find out why they're not vaccinating their children and maybe attempt to change their minds what you're doing is you end up alienating people and you end up with the situation like you said that people are going off to form their their own pods of even more aggressively not vaccinating their children and having communities where they don't vaccinate, which as you said, is very dangerous. And I think as much as we need to do everything we can to protect children who maybe can't be vaccinated, we also really do need to be doing everything we can to open a conversation with people who don't want to vaccinate their children and see if there's something we could do to make them feel more comfortable and more happy vaccinating their children. I mean, I completely agree with you. It's it's such a, a legal minefield, really, because it's just uh, where morality and engagement um, interact. As Even though I have mixed feelings towards the punitive measures, I also appreciate that we can't expect people to make correct decisions when they're not informed. Exactly. Um, so on my final question uh, for the podcast, it's a lighthearted and completely off topic, um, but I read about you that you're actually uh, a comedian. Is that true? <laughs> so I have recently been trying my hand a little bit at some science based stand up comedy. It's a bit of a fun and different way to do public engagement. And it's really nice to look at your research in a different light. So I've done a few gigs. I did end up playing my ukulele on a stage at a music festival, singing a song about fruit flies in space. Um, but because I really enjoy doing public engagement, um, I, I heard a lot of advice, actually, that doing comedy improv can be really good for your public engagement because it really increases your listening skills. So I don't know if you've ever seen TV shows like Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yeah. Yeah. So it's those kind of games where you're you're having to come up with things on the spot. So I'm actually taking a comedy improv course at the moment and really enjoying just doing something a bit fun outside of the lab but also learning to communicate better and really listen and respond to a situation. So that's it for this episode of Inside the Petri Dish. It was an incredible pleasure to have Katie on my podcast. And stay tuned for the next episode where we explore this topic further and have another amazing guest. So until next time, see you later. <laughs>